What? You're kidding me. You you still haven't read Pilgrim's Progress yet? Every Christian reads Pilgrim's Progress. This is something that you just have to do. Look, uh, I posted on Twitter the other day uh, that I just finished reading Pilgrim's Progress again, and every time I get to the end of the story, I find my heart just kind of welling up with tears and emotion. It's an amazing, amazing story. You get to the end of the book. I'm talking about part one, at least. Pilgrim's Progress has two parts. Um, mostly, we're going to talk about part one here today. When Pilgrim, a Christian he's called and hopeful, they get to the river, which symbolizes death. They go through the, the river of death. Uh, it's an agonizing moment for Christian. And he and Hopeful find themselves on the shores of eternity. It's a beautiful scene. And then... In this stunning move, the book actually ends with ignorance who also crosses the river of death. Everybody has to die, of course, in the story as in real life. And ignorance is turned away because he doesn't have the certificate that Christian and Hopeful have, which is justification by grace and faith alone. I was just moved by that. I posted that on Twitter. I got the most likes I think I've ever had on Twitter before. I usually don't get a ton of response on Twitter. Um, but I think a lot of people resonated with just how emotional the end of the book is. It's a fantastic story. Um, what I'd like to do in this short video is to um, give you several reasons why you have to read this book. You have to read Pilgrim's Progress. It's just a necessity. Uh, let me give you several reasons. First of all, welcome to this channel. My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. Uh, we are a Reformed, Bible-believing church, Presbyterian, PCA church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church that believes the Bible is true, is preaching Christ, is on a mission to share the gospel of the world, come, please visit us, Gospel Fellowship PCA. We have services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on the Lord's Day. Well, I want to give you seven reasons why you have to read Pilgrim's Progress. And I'm not kidding here. This is a pastoral exhortation. I'm admonishing you if you haven't yet read Pilgrim's Progress. It's incredible. You're going to love it. The first reason is because the story itself is absolutely gripping. This is what amounts to be a fast-paced novel. It is all action. You're not going to find any sections in which the plot just kind of lingers for chapter after chapter. There's nothing like that. The whole plot moves very, very quickly. Now, if you're not familiar, let me just give you a basic outline here. The story is an allegory. It's a spiritual allegory of what the Christian life is. And so as you're reading Pilgrim's Progress, you realize that you are Christian. If you're a Christian, you are on the same exact journey that Christian is on. It's a journey from death to life. And Christian begins a story, a spoiler alert. Of course, the book's been out for several hundred years, so you can't really claim I ruined, a, with, ruined it with a spoiler. But Christian begins in the city of destruction. He is called by the book, which is, of course, Holy Scripture, to the life of a pilgrim in which he's going to make a treacherous and highly dangerous journey from the city of destruction, which is doomed to be judged by God, to eternal life on the other side of that river of death. And as he makes this incredible pilgrimage, of course, he's going to go through a number of difficulties. Um, along the way, his burden of guilt is going to fall off when he comes to the cross. He's going to have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, which, of course, that imagery is drawn by John Bunyan, uh, the writer from Psalm 23. He's going to go through Vanity Fair, which is something like the worldly temptations that we all have to experience in this uh, grotesque world that we find ourselves walking through. He's going to make some mistakes along the way. He's going to take a wrong turn at Bypath Meadow. He's going to have to fight the devil, and he's going to have to fight the giants. And at the end of the story, of course, he finally is saved unto eternal life. It's a beautiful story written by John Bunyan, one of the great uh, Puritan theologians, a Baptist theologian, in fact. And this story has moved many, many, many generations. Every generation of Christians reads Pilgrim's Progress, which is why I'm so ashamed of you, dear viewer, that you haven't read the, the book yet. Now, I'm kidding, of course, but you do have to read it. And uh, let me give you a second reading, reason to do so, and that is that Pilgrim's Progress is one of those books where, uh, I, I don't want to overstate this, but it is a literary necessity for you to read Pilgrim's Progress at some time. If you want to consider yourself a person who is broadly read and uh, broadly intelligent, if you want to consider yourself an intellectual in the Western world, <laughs> there are certain things that you just have to know. The Bible, of course, is number one. You cannot even conceive of yourself as an intellectual person at all if you haven't read the Bible. Okay, That should be just taken for granted. But there are other good books, too, that have so shaped 
Western society through literature that it's hard to consider yourself an intellectual if you haven't read them. So let me just throw out a few, and of course this list could be endlessly debated, but if you haven't read The Scarlet Letter, if you don't know something about Moby Dick, if you don't know something about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, there's so many books like this where they're just so constantly referred to in society and if you don't get the reference a scarlet letter a if you if you wouldn't get the symbolism there it's like okay where, where did this person go to school and pilgrim's progress is the same thing um, if you come to the grocery store shelf and you see a magazine called vanity fair if you think that that's just <laughs> that's they came up with that um, just like glamour magazine or something else came up with their title they just thought oh that'd be a cool title do you not know that the reason Vanity Fair magazine is called Vanity Fair is because they're drawing that from this outrageously seductive, sensual, um, worldly, lusty city of Vanity Fair in Pilgrim's Progress? Did you not know that that magazine was actually a reference to this Christian book? And of course, they're sort of exalting in the fact that uh, the the, the women's magazine is just filled with lusty ideas and all these kinds of things. But did you not get that? You didn't know that that was a reference to Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, I used to have a mentor. He's, unfortunately, he is with the Lord now. He was a wonderful mentor while I had him. He was, uh, his name was Dr. Bellamy. And Dr. Bellamy was actually a disciple of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. So I kind of traced my spiritual lineage back through Martin Lloyd-Jones. And uh, Bellamy, we would have these conversations about pastoral life all the time, and he was a great encourager to me. And he would constantly drop references to Pilgrim's Progress, assuming that I would get them. Of course I did. I'd read the book several times. But he would talk about, uh, he would say, oh, it sounds like you're in the, the slew of despond right now. Or now make sure you don't take a, a shortcut and cut through Bypath Meadow. And he would assume that I would get the reference. And of course I did get the reference. But um, if I hadn't read Pilgrim's Progress, those things would have largely just flown right over my head. And so not only is the story great, which is the first reason to read it, but secondly, to be a literary person, you have to get the references from Pilgrim's Progress. It's just an absolute necessity. Third, Pilgrim's Progress is a very great sampler of Puritan theology, but Puritan theology in action. Now, if you want to understand what the Puritans believed, Maybe you come from a Reformed church, as I do, and you want to know something about Puritan theology. Of course, you're going to go to certain places. You might want to know what the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches, for instance, the quintessential Puritan theological document. But there's other places you could go. There's other people you could read. Um, some people say, well, you'd go to Spurgeon and Edwards. But actually, those guys were after the Puritans. Uh, we might think of them as very, very late Puritans in some sense, but technically the Puritan uh, movement was much earlier. Um, so if you want a sample of Puritan theology, go to Pilgrim's Progress. It is theology in action as told in the story form. I'll give you an example here. Um, this idea of legal terrors is something that I've written about in my book, Holy Living, about Jonathan Edwards, because it was a concept that they, they assumed that when a person tells their conversion story, it's assumed not only that they would know and believe the gospel, but also that they would have found themselves to be totally unable to keep God's law. And when they listened for uh, one another's testimony, they would also often listen to see if somebody had gone through legal terrors. In other words, you come to the law of God and you realize you can't keep it. That should terrify you. I think of how terrifying Mount Sinai is in Exodus 19 and 20 and so forth. Well, uh, John Bunyan perfectly illustrates this in several scenes throughout Pil Pilgrim's Progress. The one scene is where Christian actually has to go to Mount Sinai. and He's afraid that the mountain is going to fall on him. Uh, there's another scene where, I can't remember if it's Hopeful or Faithful, who is recounting their testimony. And they're talking about Moses comes along and beats him with a whip. Well, why, why would he do that? I thought Moses was a good guy. Well, he is a good guy. Uh, but Moses' purpose in redemption history is uh, to give the law, which should terrify us, into turning to faith in Jesus Christ. And you would totally not understand that. If, and, well, I mean, you could understand it in various ways. But 
Um, one way is through John Bunyan's illustrations of what Christian goes through on his journey as the law terrifies him over and over again. Um, you can see a number of other instances of Puritan theology in Pilgrim's Progress. His theology of backsliding is very helpful. His theology of justification is written out very clearly in the conversation with ignorance towards the book. Uh, sanctification, perseverance of the saints, a lot of these great doctrinal formulations that the Puritans taught are illustrated through the narrative allegory of Pilgrim's Progress. So there's that. Fourth, I think you will deeply, deeply identify with the main character. Um, if you're a Christian, of course, you're going to deeply identify with the main character. And there are going to be a number of times along the way where you say to yourself, I've felt that. I know exactly what's happening here because that's my spiritual journey. Um, one such example is when Christian is going through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, two things here that are notable. First is there's this interesting scene where Christian is um, he's describing in his mind these terrifying suggestions which he thinks is coming from his own mind or his own heart but under further consideration he realizes that those are demonic voices whispering to him and not actually coming from his own heart and um, I don't know about you but when I read that I thought to myself I know exactly what he is experiencing there sometimes you have this crazy blasphemous a thought that comes out, this totally wicked idea, and you're like, where did that come from in my regenerate heart? Now, of course, we're still sinners, even though we're saved, right? That's part of the point of the book, is Christian messes up so many times. But sometimes that's the demonic influence whispering us. It's not actually ourselves telling ourselves these things, but the demons suggesting them to us. This is, um, of course, very interesting, because if you read John Bunyan's spiritual autobiography, which is called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he describes himself as having gone through this tremendous bout of blasphemous thoughts where he thinks he's not even saved because of the craziness of the thoughts that come into his mind. But he writes that into the story in such a, a, a winsome way, a great, greatly illustrative way that we see that and we're like, oh yes, that has happened to me too. Um, there's so many instances like that when Christian finds true friendship in Faithful and Hopeful. Hopefully you can see your own story in that. Um, this going back and forth in the story between resting and striving. Sometimes we need to strive and fight and other times we need so much rest in the Christian life. I think you're going to find yourself relating to the story in any number of ways throughout. Fifth, if you happen to be a pastor or a teacher, Bible teacher, small group leader, Man, listen, Pilgrim's Progress is going to give you the greatest sermon illustrations. Now, if you've ever read a Spurgeon sermon, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of all time, you'll notice that he is constantly referring to Pilgrim's Progress. And again, um, if you hadn't read Pilgrim's Progress, then a lot of what Spurgeon says is just going to whoop go right over your head. You're not even going to get the reference. He's assuming that his hearers know the story of Pilgrim's Progress. And if you don't, you're going to miss it. But if you happen to be a preacher, then uh, Pilgrim's Progress is going to be for you a great, rich source of your own sermon illustrations. You can preach this stuff. Uh, it just comes to life. And even if your hearers haven't necessarily read the book, you can describe these things in such ways that the point will come across very, very clearly. I have um, a digital notebook where I keep sermon illustrations. I call it my, my DMs, my digital miscellanies. And they're alphabetized by topic. And so many times I have uh, taken a picture of a paragraph from Pilgrim's Progress, ripped the text from that picture, and then placed it in my digital miscellaneous because I'm going to want to use this over and over again as sermon-rich illustrations for preaching and teaching. Sixth, Pilgrim's Progress is a delight to all ages. It truly, truly is. Um, I have a friend, true story, just talked to him on the phone the other day. And he was telling me that he got uh, a version of Pilgrim's Progress for his child. He said that he has never seen his son. Son's, uh, ah, what is he, five? I don't know. He's never seen him captivated by a book like this before. He is just enthralled with Pilgrim's Progress. It's got great illustrations. It's got great pictures. Many of the copies of Pilgrim's Progress do come with illustrations. But whether it's a small child or a teenager or adults, you're going to find this book speaks at various levels to various kinds of people. 
Um, couple, it's been a couple years now, but my family and I, we read through Pilgrim's Progress out loud at the dinner table. So that's something that you could do too. You could just read it out loud. It's your story time, your devotional time at night. Um, your family would love it. Adults, teens, children, everybody loves Pilgrim's Progress. Finally, I'll say this. Doing this book as a study is actually a form of Bible study. Now, it might not be the best way to do Bible study. Usually the best way to do Bible study is to simply open your Bible and work through passages. That's why we preach expository sermons. That's why we teach books of the Bible. That's what we do. Bible studies focused on books of the Bible. Like I just came from my men's judges Bible study just right before I filmed this video. Studying the book of Judges. I will tell you this. You can do Pilgrim's Progress as a Bible study and there's one reason for that, and that is that John Bunyan, the author, consistently, relentlessly, and constantly puts biblical material into the book, directly into the book. And when I say directly into the book, I mean direct quotations, scriptural references, scriptural, scriptural allusions, scriptural glosses, constant biblical content throughout, such that when I teach through Pilgrim's Progress, and I've taught through it completely twice now from beginning to end, um, part of what we do is we look at the story and analyze the characters, but then there are so many biblical references that we go through the major uh, biblical doctrines as Bunyan gives, this, gives them to us in uh, quite laid out form throughout the entirety of the book. So you can actually use Pilgrim's Progress as a Bible study. At some point, I'd like to get my notes for that um, available to, to you all as I've made other note sets available to you in the past. I hope to do that at some point in the future. All right, final thing I wanna say here before we close out for today is a, a little bit about selecting a copy of Pilgrim's Progress. This is easier said than done, unfortunately, because as the second greatest selling book of all time next to the Holy Bible, Pilgrim's Progress obviously has gone through a number of editions and revisions and abridgments, uh, illustrated, non-illustrated. So let me say this, first of all, if you get the original Pilgrim's Progress, it is going to read very, very much like the King James Bible to you. If you like that and you get it, then get the original. Just read the original. It's available probably almost for free on Amazon as a Kindle book or from various other sources um, online. You can do that. If you find King Jamesy language to be a struggle for you, there are any number of modern editions. However, some are better than others. The first thing you need to know is that part one and part two are often not sold together. Uh, part two is a completely different story that tells of Christian's wife and his sons then making the same journey from destruction to eternal life, although they encounter different, different trials along the way. Um, that is not quite as necessary for you to read, I would say. It's not nearly as well known or as well treasured by Christians throughout the ages as part one. So I'm primarily talking about part one here in this video. Um, but, but beware of abridgments. There are so many abridgments to the story where for the sake of children or kids' books, they've taken the story and they've, they've really just cut out a ton of material and put in pictures in their places. That's fine as far as it goes. I don't have a problem with that. Um, kids can read the book too in shorter form. But I would say, um, be careful what edition you get. Just various different uh, levels of language used. Um, not bad language, just difficulty in reading. Um, but, but there's one edition that stands out above, above all the others that I would recommend to you, and that is the, the edition that is done by Crossway. Okay, I'm going to post a link to it in the description of this video so you can toggle down and get the exact edition. There's a number of reasons why I recommend this particular edition, and I, I highly recommend it to you. Number one, it contains the full story of part one without any abridgment. So you're not going to miss anything. There's nothing that's cut out. There's nothing that's removed. It does not contain part two, the story of Christina, but it does contain everything in part one. So you want a book that has everything in it, nothing cut out. Second, the language has been mildly revised from the King Jamesy to something equivalent to like the new King James, where it's line for line, word for word, paragraph for paragraph, nothing removed. But the these and the thous have been replaced by the yous and the yours, so to speak. So if you're used to reading a modern translation of the Bible, like the ESV or the NIV or the NASB, 
then this is going to be a really good addition for you. CJ Lovick is the person who did the mild, mild revision of the language, but it's going to be very, very faithful to the original as John Bunyan wrote it. Not only that, but this book is uh, sewn, and a lot of them are just glued and made out of crappy material, bad paper and whatnot. This is a fantastic edition. It is a sewn edition. It is hardback. The paper is glossy, very durable, and it has a number of very, very excellent illustrations, full color pictures in it that'll help you understand the story as you go. So that's, that's awesome. And not only that, but this particular edition has a ton of biblical reference footnotes. Not all of the editions have this. But this one has the scripture references at the bottom. So uh, whenever he quotes a scripture directly, it'll be it'll be um, it'll be footnoted at the bottom. And then finally, in the back, in the back matter, there is for every single chapter a brief description of the spiritual allusions and analogies that Bunyan is making. So if anything is lost on you, you can turn to the back, and the editor there did a very good job of helping describe what's happening spiritual spiritually, the doctrines that are being explained and other things that the reader might miss on a kind of cursory read-through or superficial read-through of the book. The back stuff is very, very helpful. Okay, well, thank you so much for checking in on this video. Again, what are you doing? You haven't read Pilgrim's Progress? Let's go. Let's go. you got to read this book. It's amazing. Um, again, links in the description. Love you lots. Thanks for checking in, and we will talk to you later.